before we, uh, the, I must say, there's a wonderful quality of all your films now that I've seen all three that, that we're presenting tonight. And it's, as happens with dreams, and as happens with memories, you know, we, when, we, when dreams flow uh, in our heads and when we're recalling memories, you know, very often they're just chaos and we impose a story on them. And I find that what I, what I find really rich and exciting about your work is you actually manage to catch the state of dream and memory before, before the, the stories get imposed on them and, and we in the audience are, are, as it were, putting together the puzzle pieces. The puzzle pieces are there to be put together. That's what I feel is really enjoyable. But that's just an observation I'd like to make. And we can talk about that aspect of your work, but I first thought I'd just start with a really practical question about, uh, you know, Voice of Life, which is, how in the world did you get to empty Hollywood Boulevard? <laughs> so this is my, my favorite story as, as a producer and actor of this, this little film. Um, you know, it, it's uh, several years ago we started talking about this short story by Knud Thompson. The reason why I first met Knud Eric is I made a, a rather uh, is an extremely independent version of uh, the famous novel by Knud Thompson called Hunger. And uh, Maria Geis directed it, and I, I acted and produced it. It took us several years to complete. Knud Eric found out about it and promptly brought us to Norway to show the film. Uh, in the next year or so, we discussed making another piece uh, of Thompson. It's a short story called Voice of Life takes place around, I think it was written in 1903, uh, in Oslo at that time. It's dark, it's mysterious, it's on the streets, it's empty. And when we finally got the money and, and everything came to Hollywood to make the film, he said, you know, we have to do this. It has to be completely empty on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> and he said, luck. You know, that's just, I said, no, no, it's not going to happen. And, it's impossible, there's, there's crazy people at every hour, four o'clock in the morning, there's Mickey Mouse and Batman and everybody's running down Hollywood Boulevard, it's just not going to happen. I said, but we can, you know, we can try to, you know, I said, we really should do it the opposite. We should have a superior costume and have lots of people and put them in soft focus. And I had this whole other vision for the film. And he said, no, 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 you have to have it completely empty. <laughs> and I said, well, we could try cheating it, that's what, do as filmmakers, we can wait for a couple people to walk by and say, okay, we got 10 seconds where it seemed to be empty. Well, we got out there at 12 o'clock at night. I said, the only way we could even possibly hope to do it is by from midnight till dawn. And we set up in the parking lot behind the Chelly's uh, near the Egyptian Theater. And we had our team there. And we got off a couple of shots. About 12.30, the police came and started putting orange cones across Hollywood Boulevard for three blocks to the east and three blocks to the west. And I was like, what are they doing? And I suddenly saw one of those machines coming along, grinding up the road. They were repaving Hollywood Boulevard for the next four nights in a row. And we were there. They blocked off all the streets, from till dawn, and we had free reign of Hollywood Boulevard to capture it with no cars, no people, nothing. We walked up and down, that's a beautiful Elidor Peterson. We, you saw this shot of us in, in the Groman's Chinese courtyard there, there's not a soul there. It looks like it's CGI, it's real. Every part of it is real. And that is the magic of the film gods, if you, Want something bad enough? <laughs> Sometimes they smile. It costed me though one million dollars. <laughs> we saved one million dollars. <laughs> That's the magic of voice of life. You have to be naive, you know, in this world to uh, achieve something. Yeah. Words from the master. You something that you had said when we were talking earlier, <laughs> Eric, is that um, coincidence is for you, uh, uh, it, it's something that you, um, that informs you just in life and I think in your work, that you work out of coincidence. Could you talk a little about that? 
Well, uh, when I start a story, for instance, in this uh, Stella Polaris, it was decay. Uh -huh. I was on, you know, on a normal trip to this small place, and I saw this guy standing alone in the ocean. Mm. And that was my first association. When you say quay, you mean the, the docks with the... Yeah, uh, that was out in the water. Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess it, it, it's pronounced quay in quay, English, yeah. or a, yeah, a dock, yeah, a pier, yeah. 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 So the whole film started out from that uh, image. Mm. So I just built it up by associations all the time. Right. Know? Yeah. So right. Did you grow, uh, as uh, recalling Norway's geography, you know, we we think of it as the coast on the Atlantic, but there's a coast that bends around and uh, the top of the peninsula and is it bordered on the Soviet Union, which is very much a part of the next film, Burnt by Frost. But, you know, you evoke that region so vividly in both Burnt by Frost and, and Stella Polaris. And I want to know a little about you. Did you grow up in that particular region? And Because and, it seems really devastated by the war more than we understand about the rest of Norway. Mm. When I was born, uh, we used to say I was the first shot that the people from Finnmark <laughs> did against the Germans. I was born in 1940, uh, in, uh, not far from this place actually, up in the very north, close to the North Cape. October 8th, by the way, so happy birthday belatedly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I was born there, yes, and I stayed the two four, first years of my life in this uh, small village close by this one. And we were evacuated first to one place in 42 uh, to get away from uh, the Germans uh, and, and the torpedoes and the bombings and everything. So we went to a small island for two years and then in 44 we were evacuated uh, further south. Uh, with my mother, my father had at that time, not to be too private, but two families. So he left one of the families, which means uh, my mother and my sister who was one and a half years old. I was four, my, sis my brother was seven, and my uh, sister was 14. So we were set off in a desolate place somewhere, and there was a horse and a carriage picking us up, bringing us to a farm where we stayed for a period of time. And then, uh, when the war was over, the brothers of my uh, mother were evacuated to England because of, they were in Spitsburg, in the Svalbard, even further north. Oh. So we didn't know if they were alive or not, but uh, in '45 they came back. So I was in an evacuation camp, a former German camp and also a Russian uh, camp, uh, prisoner camp, close by. And uh, yeah, so I lived in, in, the in the German barracks. In the German barracks, first, yes, yes. 12 years of your life. 12 years I passed in German barracks, yes, with the, with the swastika beneath and the swastika on top. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story before the before I returned to my home place uh, in '51. And when they were during the reconstruction. The, the, the reconstruction, because when the Germans were routed by the Russians, you want to explain about what they did? Yeah, of course, it, it's a scorched earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they returned uh, in 44, mm -hmm. they were losing, you know, the battles everywhere, also in the north, mm -hmm. and they drew back from the Finnmark area, and they used a scorched earth strategy. That will, that means that they burnt everything. In my hometown, it was only the church left, but they, you know, they destroyed 100% mm -hmm. everything in an area which is twice the size of Denmark, almost as big as Portugal, or as Scotland, you know. Mm. This area was completely destroyed by the Germans, mm. so there was nothing left, you might say. Yeah. Wow. So we returned in the reconstruction period. But it's very interesting to, to know that about you, because to have been deprived of a home for so such a sustained period in the first 12 years of your life basically it it actually informs my sense of what i get from your films which is that as i said you know when the film you're about to see uh, burnt by frost when i was watching it um i was confused at first because i'm thinking okay is this movie set in 1962 during the cuban missile crisis or is it set in 1944 when the the Germans are still occupying Norway because there was the, the memories flow into one another such 
Now, this was a confusion that I didn't mind, strangely enough. I hope that you had that same experience, that it was actually, I was just kind of wondering, and it was, I was flowing back and forth between, between trying to decide, and I felt that it became a very powerful aspect of experiencing your films, which is that in putting it together, I become a lot like the protagonist of your film. I'm, you know, you, you get, he's assembling his memories, and, and that kind of participation actually, although it, it's work, it nevertheless, emotionally, I felt more connected to the picture. And I, it feels like that, 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 it strikes me that that is a very uh, important personal aspect to the way you approach life itself. And I wonder, am I right in that, or how do you see it? Yeah, yes, you're right. You know, I, I consider life for uh, unforeseen. You never know what was happening you know, in your life. If you knew what was happening, life would be boring. Yes. You know? So in the, most of the conventional films, it is already decided. The whole story is already decided, which means that the industry is leading you through the film yes. in a very conventional sort of safe way. The only question is, is the, 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 the man going to be murdered after the first door, the second door, or the third door? My life, you know, nobody knew that we were going to sit here, but in a conventional film it was already planned. But in my life it was not planned. So you might say that the, 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 the advantages of the film language yeah. is that there is no limits. You can do exactly what you want and also your dream kind of history is out of control in a way. You never know what kind of association comes up. You know, when you turn around the corner here, you see somebody that resembles of your father, and suddenly you are back to your childhood. Yeah. Or your dreams cannot be controlled. I don't know what people are thinking just here and now. So I wanted to make a film where you don't know what's going to happen in a way, even though the story can be simple, complicated and manfolded. Yes. And if you ask who is telling the story, mm -hmm. who is telling the story? I don't know, it's you. Yeah. It's the spectators because you can approach it in any way you want. You don't need in a way to follow a story. But if there is a story, maybe, well, what is important? You never know what's going to, to happen. And it's dangerous to go on the street. You might be hit by a car. Right. You never know. No, it's true. That's the exciting thing about life. Yeah, and the terrifying thing, if we can reconsider that scene in the garden path, that peaceful scene after Norway's liberated and the, the two children are walking along a path and you think, ah, you know, and then all these schoolboys show up and they're worse than the Nazis, you know, and they're, they're school, you know, it's the, that, that was so potent and, and, and it, it really, just like it's one of the things I take away from the film. I wanted to ask in terms of the unexpected though, because we have Joseph here. It, what does this mean for your work with actors? How, do, how, do, how is the unexpected, I'll, I'll turn this to Joseph, how, how does that unexpected principle uh, come to you as an actor and the, the instructions you're given? You know, that's it, a really good question. And it, 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 it's very similar to what you were just saying. This idea that you know we we don't like to admit it very much, but you know, we have one film, particularly in America. Um, I could say a lot of the Western world, but there's one film, and we keep making it, and it really is the same film. And we do follow a pretty strong convention that we take for granted, which is that it starts like this, and then there's a second act, and it kind of peaks, and then we have a big third act, and that's kind of our movie whether it's an action, a drama, a comedy. And when I just, I hear Kim Derek talk about thinking about film differently, thinking that, well, maybe there's a story there, but how do we really experience life? How, maybe it doesn't all come in, a, in this linear fashion. And yet, you know, you can still draw the story in this other way, in a more intuitive way, perhaps, and find out, well, what, what tells me the story? And I, I'm really taken by that. And, and, and I think it applies to how you work with actors. Um, we did Voice of Life, and I also shot a film called Ice Kiss, um, mm -hmm. which we uh, did a few years ago. Um, 
you know, it seems to me that you're interested in something that is not land and is not thought about too much in advance and a performance that is not sculpted but rather experienced in that moment and I noticed that I there were times when you would say to me yeah just you know keep relaxing you know keep mm -hmm. relaxing you don't don't think about what you need to do in this moment. And I am a method actor. I'm, I'm all into improvisation. But it was very different. Because it was still like, well, what, what do you want the scene to be about? And like, well, we're not sure yet. You know, and if you, if you allow yourself to be more open to what's happening here, then there'll be an open quality in how the audience will take the, the image. Yes. So it won't be like, it won't be already congealed. You know? can right. stay free to have interpretations come. And that became you know, a state of mind that was a little more zen, a little more, I don't know even what I'm doing here. I know there's a beautiful woman, and there's a feeling I have, and, and I'm just trusting that. Am I getting this at all right? <laughs> yes, yeah, you are. I remember when we were doing it, you know, and um, you were saying to me, that you were looking at uh, Ellen, you know, the, the actress, and you said, she's not doing anything, but I know what she's thinking, and I know in a way, but how, how, how can I react to this? And I say, the only way to react to this is not to act. Mm. You know, you have to lay off all your, uh, your Hollywood kind of uh, things that you have to keep your hand on something, or you have to, there has to, something has to happen. And I say, what is happening is nothing. And that is, you know, very good, because if it is too much, and it, there are some fantastic moments where you are just, just 100% in the situation. That's the difference, I think, between acting and being, you know, yeah. because the screen is, is very, um, it's very big, and you don't need so much. You need the eyes, and you know, the way you look at each other, and the small movements in the faces, and the rest is for the audience. Right. I was wondering, just on a technical level, because so much of the story is dialogue. It's a, it's a kind of almost ritual of dialogue, of pickup dialogue. He's trying to get to know this girl. But, the, the intentions are in, unstable. We don't know if he just wants to walk her home or, you know, it's just that that's great. But I'm thinking, okay, you guys had to have memorized that text, you know, that you had, but what did it work out like in terms of just performing it for the camera? Did, were there moments when you would have said something but you decided to shut up? I mean, and, and, and or you decided to speak? How did you, how did you gauge that? How did you conduct that? Uh, my, my memory is it was a little bit like uh, working in silent film, which is that the director really was there saying, okay, so you're just looking at her, and then maybe you say the line. And, and I was really, you know, I remember just responding a bit like a puppet, you know, in a way, and, and saying, yeah, that's, that's, there's something there. There's something there. What do you see in her? And so he really did a lot of talking through it. To, to achieve a state of just being, being that was open to possibility. And the text, uh, we learned the text, um, but you know, the text, it's elliptical, the way he created it. So he says, you look at her and just think it. Now look at her and say the line. Yeah. And then in the editing process, he made decisions about how, because there's something very dreamlike in Voice of Life. Is, is this a dream or is it really happening? There, there you hear thoughts, and then they say the thoughts later yeah. on. And so it has that quality. You know when you dream, there are repetitions of the same idea, and yeah. it comes in different times in your dream? That's very close to what happens there. Well, I wanted to ask you about, uh, there's a specific um, moment, a specific juxtaposition that happens in both the films we've just seen, in Voice of Life and now in Stella Polaris. In, Voice of Life is a moment when Ellen has undressed and she's, you know, her nude body is, you know, she's walking down the corridor away from us. And in the next, next moment of the film, boom, we, we see a body in a coffin. It's, it's the, the, uh, the figure in the coffin who 
resembles our protagonist, but at a much more advanced age. It's a kind of trippy moment, but it's also, you're going from body to body. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost an explicit rhyme. And here in Stella Polaris, you had a moment where the boy is yanked with the string off into the water, falls backwards into the water, and then wham, where the couple are making love in the field. And now you could say, okay, death and sex, but no, it doesn't quite, doesn't hold as, you know, a kind of stable meaning. It's simply, it's like a billiard shot. It, you know, the, the ball propels into the next ball and, and, and pushes it further. But I think, okay, that's, it's one of the few moments, it's probably maybe the moment when I could say, ah, the director is conscious or is making us conscious of what, of what he's juxtaposing. Otherwise, you're, you submerge everything. I think, okay, that's very interesting. Do you, do you plan that in advance or do you arrive at it on the editing table? How, does, how do you get to those moments when you're pointing, you know, when you're, you're going to reveal to the audience that are at turning point? Um, my manuscripts are written complete as as a storyboard almost. Mm. You know, so everything is because of money and everything. You have to do it precise, but it's as I say, from association to association in a way. So everything, movements and everything, is written in the manuscript. So when everything is done, we have four to six weeks together with the photographer. I'm reading from the manuscript and he is drawing all the drawings. Yeah. So everything is done for him and 99% of Stella Polaris was done in the manuscript. There are only two or three things that have been changed in the editing. Oh, wow. So the whole film is seen, is written like a film. Because then you, 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 you have a, a film already written yeah. and at the same time you have possibilities to right. do some things afterwards. But you vision, you vision those moments. Yes, I agree. Before yeah. you even get to yes. shoot them. There, there are three, so three different things from the manuscript. I won't tell you which they are, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no big secrets, but there are two or three things that have been changed from right. the position it was in the manuscript. How long do you work on a manuscript? Do you, you know, tell, tell us about that process. Yeah, you, this manuscript, I was thinking about it for a long, 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 long time. I read the synopsis, and then I went uh, with a beautiful woman on holiday, and I brought two CDs with uh, Beethoven's uh, sonatas. Uh. And I played it and wrote the manuscript, and when this uh, CD was over, it was one, over in five minutes, I was out and had a Coca-Cola at the at swimming pool, and I went back and played the other one. So I did this manuscript in three weeks, actually, for Stella Polaris. Wow. Three weeks of writing. You know. wow. But a lot of thinking beforehand. But to write it down, three weeks. Great. I want to invite you. Are there any questions uh, burning to get to us in the audience? So way in the back there. Yes, sir. Do you draw a lot of inspiration from French cinema in the 60s? No, I won't say so. I, I'm, um, I'm very alone in a way because I'm, you know, I'm the only idiot in Norway <laughs> that never went south, you know, never went to Oslo. I always stay in my career in the north mm. because as I say, a director is the only one that don't need to know anything. If you're a bad soul man, <laughs> it's no good. If you're a bad cameraman, it's, it would be seen. But if you have good actors, you know, and are a director, you don't need to know anything. So that's why you can live anywhere. This is, of course, a joke. But, <laughs> but I grew up, as I said, in this small uh, town where we had uh, a German barrack as my first cinema. And coming from a social democracy, it was the state that decided that every small place should have a cinema. And in this cinema, films from all over the world should be shown. Mm. So my first films I saw up there, you know, I saw Bergman, you know, all these films, Hiroshima, Monamo, you know, all these films I saw in this German barrack until towards the end of the 50s. Mm. So. Uh, 
they made impressions on me, you know, but I saw films from the Soviet Union, from France, from Italy, from America, of course, Johnny Weissmuller, you know, all yeah. these kind of things. So I saw all kind of films. So I, I won't say that something specially inspired me to, 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 uh, to do this or that, you know, I, I don't think I ever copied anything. No, one doesn't feel you copying anything at all, but there are, I mean, as the critic, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that you have... Desperately searching for something. Desperately searching, yeah, for, for, for your, your missing cousins, you know, and, you know, they're far-flung cousins like Andre Tarkovsky and Mirror specifically, or, or Terrence Malick and To the Wonder, or, or Terrence Davies and The Long Day Wanes, and I don't think you're copycatting those guys, but you're, you're definitely... You're digging a canal that runs parallel to what they do. Do you feel a kinship with those filmmakers or, you know, uh, or if I go back to my, my education, I was among, we were 10 together that took the first, uh, what do you say, high school right. in Honingsvog. And after that I went to the university, you know, coming from a fishing village, right. it was impossible actually. But I studied history to try to learn something about the world and myself and my own position in the world. And then I thought I will uh, study French because that's a European continental language. If you know French, it's easier to learn Spanish, Portuguese and Italian. So I studied French, stayed in France for a period. And then I thought, what is the third matter? Russian. Mm. So I studied Russian, had one year's um, a scholarship in Russia because we have, you know, a common border. Yes. So this border in Norway was the only border that the Soviet Union had straight to NATO. Mm. All the other borders were controlled by the Soviet Union, but Norway was the only open country towards NATO. So I wanted to find out what this continent was about, so I decided to study Russian. Mm. I stayed there for one year. So, uh, and maybe, yeah, maybe maybe I more to London as well. Mm -hmm. was London, London. Yes, when I had finished my studies, I put my first uh, camera in, in Russia, which was a double eight. Mm -hmm. I asked, uh, what guarantee do I have for the quality of this camera? And they said, it's made for war purposes, so it must be quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was my first camera. And when I came back, I had made a film, you know, on the churchyard that I was happily enough to show to one of my friends who said, you are a visual genius, you should be to go to a film school. <laughs> so he pushed me to London, where I went to a film school. And then when I came back, I did all my films up in the north and was waiting for the plane to go to London from Oslo. So I actually edited all my first films in London. I shot them in Finnmark and edited them in, in London. So, you know, coming from this north, I consider myself a cosmopolitan that is influenced by anything, everything. Yeah. Without saying, this was a very intelligent answer to this very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Are you influenced by something? Yeah. Any other questions out there? Yours, sir, in the way back. Yes. Uh, the little girl uh, in the feature was quite intriguing. Very good question. Because you know, when I was making this, I had a producer that said, "You have to have an audition. You have to shoot and film on video, or whatever." Every single girl, you know, in the whole area, which is, as I said, twice the size of Denmark, you have to find every school girl at this age and do an audition and see which who, who is the best. And I said, "Well, okay." So we did some shooting, and then I went on a research to this island because we were going to shoot there. And there were 10 um, pupils in the whole area. And they went together, you know, from the first grade until the, the seventh grade or something like that. And uh, we were just looking around. And then we had to run for the, the boat to get back to, to, to the center. And I was running to reach the boat. I was the last one, as always, running. And then I just stumbled over a girl that came running out from a door down the steps. Mm. And you know, I stopped like that. Yeah. And I said, you know, um, what's the 
what is your name? And she said, it's not of your business. <laughs> and then came back, and at this school, there were, as I said, 10 pupils. And I got there and, you know, said we used, we had uh, used for, for extras and so on and so forth. And everybody was looking at me, except for the boy. He was just looking at her. So I found both the girl and the boy after having auditioned with, I don't know how many, in this single class. She's now a nurse and she never followed the... She went on to something more intelligent and filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> and more useful. <laughs> well, I think we just, uh, I'd like to ask just two more questions. Uh, Joseph, uh, I wanted to ask you just about what is ahead for you, what you're working on next. Thank you. Well, um, one of the things that uh, we can brag about right now, uh, two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, I uh, had the first public screening of my new feature film in the hometown of this man uh, in Honningsvog, Norway, uh, where the Nordcap Film Festival happens every year. It's a wonderful festival. Knuderic is the spiritual godfather of this festival. Um, and it's in this incredible location, which you saw a lot of it in this film, uh, the one with the big mountain. Uh, there was a lot of mountains. But you are hereby invited. You are all invited to Hunting's Log next year. Uh, I've been there six times now. So, Welcome to the Men's Group is my new feature film. I just finished it and just uh, premiered it publicly to a great uh, response, I'm happy to say. It will also play at the Tromsø Festival in January in Norway. And right now we're waiting to hear about a number of festivals here in the States, and hopefully we'll be doing uh, a screening right here at the Arrow um, in the next few months. Um, it's a film I made with uh, my, my friend Timothy Bottoms, who's here somewhere. There is. There he is. Thank you. And, um, and several other, uh, Ali Sam, who is here. Where's Ali? There he is. He's in it. It's eight guys in a room talking to each other, and it goes rather crazy. Um, so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and so that's, uh, and then the next thing uh, that Eric and I are talking about is another feature, and I can't say too much about that, but it has, uh, it has sort of Doctor Strange Love and satire written all over it. Um, but wow, we're dealing with war in the world. And, um, and yeah, I'm working on a new play, and so it's a bit of film, a bit of theater, and a, a lot of travel, and um, yeah, and exciting times. Well, Ludelic, I'm, I'm glad to know. I don't want to violate the privacy of what you're, but you, what you're brewing up next, because it sounds like you've, you've got, got a few meetings ahead. But uh, I, I do want to just tee up the, the next film, Burnt by Frost. I thought, um, you know, just, it, your studying of Russian culture really emerges in this film because it's, it's so much a uh, Russia, Norway, and the, and the legacy of the Nazis so so informs everything you see. Is there anything um, you wish to share with us by way of an introduction uh, to this next picture? Well, what I would say generally is that nobody is winning a war. I saw just the caricature made by an American now because of the situation in, in Syria and elsewhere. There was a, a bomb with an American flag, and there was another bomb with a Russian flag. And under the American bomb it said, good bomb. On the other one it said, bad bomb. You know, so, so this goes on and on and on and on all the time. And um, you talk, you're, as in northern Norway, where the Germans were our enemies or common enemies, some of the Norwegians in the north went to Russia to fight the Germans. In the southern part they went to England or to Sweden. But in northern Norway it was very natural to go to Russia. So in other words, they were working together with the Russian partisans that tried to, to, to with the submarines and everything, to, to take care of the convoys that came from America and also from England to go to Murmansk where it was ice free. So, uh, the Norwegians and the Russians worked together, yeah. as you did during the war. 
Right. But then when the war was over, the Russians became our enemies. And the people that burned down the whole area where I come from became our new friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is war. Is The war has no future. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, so my films are very often about that, uh, you know, the only thing that can save the world are the women and tolerance. Yeah. And thank you. I want to ask one last, uh, you want to speak one minute or so just about your, your next project, which you're going to be shooting next year. Yes, the next project is called Longing for Today, which is a title that, you know, you always hope that today will be the day because, as I say, today will be yesterday, tomorrow. So you can never, you can only live in the past, in your dreams or in your irrationality, but you never know what happens. So Longing for Today is a film that has um, something in between Stella Polaris and Birth by Frost, an open film where it's up to the, the audience to, to uh, go into it and find their own sort of thoughts because irrationality, like jealousy, falling in love, all these kind of things, you cannot control them, you cannot control emotions. Just 10 years after the divorce, you can say it was the fault of the toothpaste, that she never put the lock on the toothpaste or something, you know. You always find a reason afterwards but once you are in the emotions, you know, you are without control. So the only control in, I think, in war and all these kind of things is to try to find other solutions than revenge or, uh, you know. So this is what my films are about and they are also very basic to nature, you know, that's why I love the landscape because landscape is part of us. Yeah. We are part of the landscape. A child being born is just a piece of nature yes. that is helpless. It's up to us what we give to them, you know. So my films are basically trying to say that the only thing that can save us is uh, tolerance and humanity and democracy. Yeah. And with these very intelligent words, I think. <laughs> yes. I, I think you've, you, it's so great. Thank you for, for contributing these alternate solutions to, to such things as war. Thank you both for being with us. Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.